you know, this falls under the rubric of parental rights legislation, right? And it started with CRT. Let's remember that. So if you start coming after these, you know, and those are anti-history laws, anti-black history laws, really. So if you start coming after black people, what comes next, right? Of course, the LGBTQ plus yeah. community, and then women, and then other marginalized right. groups. So I'm surprised that parents that sort of jumped on the bandwagon of this didn't realize that this is where it naturally leads. We've seen this so many times in our country and in history globally. That was the great Sonny Huston on uh, the not so great view, uh, the view. Um, and uh, she's really too smart to be on it. But anyway, uh, she was talking about this bill that Ron uh, dis asked us, asked, asked us, uh, Santis in Florida passed uh, where you can't say gay. It's a bill that will bar LGBTQ discussions in schools. And this is piggybacking on all of the banning of the books in this country, because what Sonny Holston is saying, first, they come for you. <laughs> and because I'm not that, I didn't care. And then they come for you. And because I'm not, you know, so let's say first they come for the blacks. I don't I'm not black, so I don't care. I don't care. Then they come for the gays. I'm not gay. I don't care. And then eventually they'll come for you and there'll be no one left to fight for your ass. So I appreciate Sunday Houston standing in the gap. And I appreciate Torrent Ellis being here today. And I also appreciate our resident historian coming in. He's the author of many, 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 many books, starting with don't know much about history because we don't. And uh, the sh in the shadow of liberty, more deadly than war, a whole book about the last pandemic we were in. And today we're going to talk about uh, the perils of the era that we're in now. Let me welcome the one and only Kenneth C. Davis. Hi. Hi, Karen. It is always a great pleasure to be with you and an honor. Thanks for inviting me. This is an important subject. And as that clip you just played uh, absolutely underscores, this is not just about a few dirty books with a few dirty words or some dirty pictures. Um, this is about how thought is controlled. And that is really the great danger here, because this is what every great, I shouldn't say great, every murderous dictator in history has done. They have controlled thoughts, they've controlled ideas. And one way to do that is to ban and eventually burn books. You, you have over your shoulder Strongman, which is your book of people in history who did this. This kind of took me by surprise when they started with the whole CRT thing. And I'm like, but that's a legal uh, curriculum taught in law school. How's that become? I was like, oh, that's going to go away because anybody with a brain knows that's not being taught in school. And then sure enough, now we got, you know, Junkin and others passing laws to ban anything that's going to make someone feel bad about themselves. And, you know, I had a histor historian on last week, um, Kevin Cruz, and he said, the big question is, why are your children identifying with the oppressor or the enslaver or the brutal person or, or, or the fascist or the Nazi? Why or the KKK? Why are they identifying with it, with those uh, figures to feel bad about themselves? That's the larger question. But tell me, how did this start? Have you been, how long have you been following this, Kenneth C. Davis? And like, when did it really catch fire and why? Well, as long as there have been books, actually before there were even books, there were book bannings and book burnings. You can go back to ancient China, an emperor burned books that uh, scrolls, actually, they weren't even books yet. Same thing in early uh, Christianity, the uh, early Christians burned the scrolls that were by the pagans because that was pagan stuff. You can't have that around. Uh, of course, once books became real books, uh, they also began to be suppressed. I have uh, uh, quite a few of them around on my bookshelves behind me. Uh, Voltaire, one of the great philosophers of the French Enlightenment, his books were burned in Paris because he was attacking not only the state, he was attacking the church. Uh, I have a, a book by a, a woman named uh, Edna O'Brien who wrote about being a, a girlhood in, in Ireland and her priest burned that book in the town square in her village in Ireland because it had sex in it. Um, this is a book called uh, The Postman Always Rings Twice by James mm -hmm. N. Cain, written, written in the 1930s. His books were banned because they were sexy. Um, back in those days, and this comes around again today, uh, back in the 1930s, for instance, if your book said banned in Boston, the publishers liked that because it meant people would go out and buy it because they thought, oh, if it's banned in Boston, it must be sexy. So there's always been that. And one other book that's very important in history is this book, 
Ulysses by James Joyce, banned uh, in this country, again, for sex, uh, until it was uh, permitted to be brought in, in in 1932. And that was a major ruling in censorship. But this is much older than that, certainly in the United States. In 1835, and this won't surprise you, uh, the people of South Carolina went into the post office and they took out thousands of pamphlets and made a big bonfire in the street. Guess what those pamphlets were about? Abolition. They were burning abolitionist literature that was being sent through the mails, flooding into the South because they didn't want these ideas. They also burned in effigy William Lloyd Garrison, the, the famous abolitionist pub publisher. Two years later in 1837, a mob in Illinois, not in the deep South, a not mob in Illinois, went and burned the abolitionist presses of a guy named Elijah Lovejoy. Um, in his case, however, they burned him as well. He was murdered by a mob of anti-abolitionists. Uh, uh, anti so there's a, uh, you know, a long secret history of book banning in this country. After the Civil War, it became about sex to, uh, to a larger degree. Then in the 1950s, uh, the, the books that were being suppressed were a little bit different. Would it surprise you if I told you a textbook commissioner in Indiana said there should be no books in school with Robin Hood? Why Robin Hood? Well, what does Robin Hood do? He steals from the rich and gives to the poor. What is that? That's socialism. That's communism. So they actually tried to get books with Robin Hood out of the schools. You can laugh at that and say, what, you know, that's crazy. But this was part of a much bigger thing that we call McCarthyism today. At the same time that that textbook commissioner was trying to get Robin Hood out of the schools, Joseph McCarthy had sent attorney Roy Cohn to all the libraries, the State Department libraries in Europe, claiming that there were thousands of books by communists in those libraries. And they started to pull them out of the, out of the libraries. And the State Department went along with it. And it was quite a story at the time. Now, the president at the time was Dwight Eisenhower. He'd just been elected, he'd just been inaugurated, but Joseph McCarthy was a very powerful man. So Eisenhower didn't want to take him on too publicly, but he made a speech in 1953 at Dartmouth University at the commencement. He said, don't join the book burners. Don't be afraid to go into every library and take out any books. We can't hide the faults in our past. So that's a, you know, a fairly conservative Republican president trying to speak against this, but there's a long history of this, obviously. What's changed in the current environment uh, is that the books that were once accused of being maybe sexy, uh, you know, books like The Catcher in the Rye, that kids shouldn't read such things, it's now turned into much more uh, a political and a racial issue. You know, this guy, in, uh, uh, this legislator in Texas put a list together of 800 books that he thought shouldn't be in schools. And they've actually got pictures of somebody going into the libraries and carting these books out. The Washington Post did a survey of those 800 books and they said, of, of not, no surprise, of the first 100 that they came across, most were by women, people of color, and also gay writers. So before, this is a very- you, Before you go on, did this person, uh, can we prove that he read those 800 books? Because uh, I, I find it interesting that people are compiling lists when I, I, I will put money on the fact that he probably never read all of those books that he is calling for a ban on. 800 books is a lot of, I read a lot of books. Uh, no, I'm not talking about you. I'm not talking about me. No, I know, I I'm know. talking about I, this person. I, I, I know, my, my point is that to, to read 800 books is, is quite a challenge. So I, I, I can't say with any certainty that he read any or all of those 800 books, but they're, you know, it's what we call the usual suspects. Anything that has something about sex in the title or my body, books that talk about uh, for young people, books aimed at young people about sexuality, maybe even about birth control and even about the dread word of abortion in Texas. These are all books that are immediately suspect just on the basis of their titles. You know, about 30 years ago, it was a big blow up in this country. A lot of schools about a book called 
Heather has two mommies. People were shocked that a book about a girl uh, being in school and she has two mommies would somehow turn all the children into, into lesbians. And that's the, the mentality we're thinking with, uh, about here. But this has become so politicized. And the best example of that, I suppose, is uh, in the Virginia governor's race a few months ago, as you probably know, the governor there uh, ran an ad in which the subject was Toni Morrison's beloved. Toni Morrison, of course, Pulitzer Prize winning black novelist, beloved may be the most, one of the most significant novels published in the last 50 years, if not the most significant novel published in the uh, last 50 years. Um, he made that book a campaign issue. Uh, this was like a new way of, a, a new dog whistle, you could call it, that you hold up beloved. What does beloved really stand for? Well, that's talking about Blacks and it's talking about slavery and we don't want that. And so that became a campaign issue in, in Virginia. And of course that Republican governor won. This comes to a new level of, I guess it would be funny if it wasn't so dangerous. This book I'm holding up for, you can see it, Karen, it's called Mouse. Mouse is a cartoon book, essentially. It's called a graphic, it's a graphic novel. novel. It's a graphic novel. Yeah. It's a graphic novel. It's not actually a novel, though, in the sense that it's a true story. It's a memoir by Art Spiegelman, whose parents were Holocaust survivors. And he had decided to try and tell this story in a different way. Uh, as, a, uh, as a cartoonist, he wrote their story and he turned all of the human characters into animals. So the Jews are mice, the Nazis are cats, and the uh, Polish people who figure in, who are the non-Jewish Poles are, are pigs. Um, this book and its successor, Mouse 2, uh, were extraordinary books when they were published. They actually won a special Pulitzer Prize uh, a nomination uh, a award. Uh, Art Spiegelman's work has been in, shown in, in museums. This book is one of the most powerful, in my opinion, powerful ways to talk about the Holocaust, especially to younger people, because it puts it in a totally different context. Um, this book was removed from uh, schools in Tennessee uh, on the basis of it having dirty words and uh, on the basis of a, a, a what are, the, what are the, the dirty words? What are the dirty words in there? You know, I, I'm I'm not sure. I, I I'm I, <laughs> I'm like I, coming through to try and find yeah. them. But yeah, the, I was the, yeah, I did the, the same. I was point, like, what's dirty? The real point I think is that nothing is more dirty than genocide. <laughs> That's the real obscenity in in life, in our world, that we should be teaching people about the horror and the crime of genocide and not worrying about a few dirty words and even more ridiculous. They said, oh, there's a picture of a naked woman. Well, not to spoil the story, Art Spiegelman's mother had committed suicide. And there is one tiny frame in this cartoon uh, in which she is seen in her bathtub. And of course she is, is naked, but you really would have to look for it and you might even need a magnifying glass to see it. So this is not really about dirty words or dirty pictures. This is about controlling thoughts, controlling ideas. And this is what every authoritarian government tries to do, especially with children. They destroy and ban books to control thought, to control ideas. Writers, the greatest writers are all about revealing the truth. They are, even when they write fiction, they're really trying, trying to tell us the truth. So when we ban books, what we're trying to really say is we're gonna ban the truth. And that's what's going on around the country with this. And of course, the most famous book burning in history perhaps, and I do write about it in Strongman, happened in 1933 in Berlin where the Nazis burned tens of thousands of books, including books by famous German writers, including books by American writers. They were all thrown on the bonfire. 
that place in Berlin is now marked as the, uh, uh, the silent library, I believe it's called. And there's a plaque there. And the plaque says, I'm going to read it because I want to be very careful about getting the words exactly right. Um, there's famous, very famous words there that when they burn books, they will next burn people. And that was written in the 1820s, but it's still as true as ever. When we start down this road of trying to suppress writers, suppress books, censor books, we are ultimately on the road where we are going to be burning people if we are not very careful. Mr. Kenneth C. Davis, I wanna just say first and foremost, I appreciate your valued contribution, you know, whenever it is that you are with Karen and sitting with the audience. And I just wondered that not, not that white people have a monopoly on fragility and this idiocy, but they most certainly are extremely vocal about it. And as a white man, what do you suggest that we do? Because burning was something that happened perhaps a long time ago. Now they're trying to legislate it. So what do you suggest that we do? I, I mean, we hear, the, we hear the fragility, we hear the idiocy, what can we do? Well, you know, uh, it's a very good question, Torin. Thank you very much. Um, part of this is we talk about voting and Karen and I have been talking about voting for a very, very long time. And we usually think about voting in terms of the Congress and the president. But what has happened around the country and it's been going on for a very long time is that there have been a, a very concerted driving effort at the local level to get people onto school boards. And then from the school board, you go to the town council and from the town council, you become the mayor and then you become the county legislature. So the, the idea of controlling these things on a very local level has been going on for a long time in this country and people haven't really been paying attention to it because we've been watching things that are going on on the national scale. So this is a very important uh, point get involved in the most local way you can, where your voice is going to be most heard. Go to the school board, go to the school board elections. I, I, I tell you that most people in most places around this, this country um, where school boards are elected positions don't pay too much attention to it. But if we think of schools, as the place where we are going to teach our children to be educated citizens who think for themselves, if that's what you believe education would be, we have to really get down on the, the real grassroots level and have a stake in what's going on in those local meetings, local school boards, local town halls. So that's the first thing, get involved. Don't wait for it to become a national issue that Congress is gonna to have to deal with. Make sure it's not happening in your own state. And that's, uh, uh, there are some other things you can do as well. If uh, you find that books are being challenged in your community, in your school, you can then say, no, I want those books in my school. Let me just say this one thing quickly about this idea of schools giving children books that might not be appropriate for them. I speak to a lot of teachers. I speak to a lot of librarians in those places. Almost all of them will tell you that as a matter of policy, if a child has uh, is assigned a book or takes a book home from the library to which their parent objects, the librarian or the teacher will find a suitable alternative, but they won't take all of those books out of the school so no one else can read them. There is a rational way around this, this kind of idea. Sure, there might be a, a, a book that you as a parent might object to. And I, I should be very clear here that there is you know, a, 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 a powerful movement on the other side to remove books that are seen as harmful to black children. The most notable example, of course, being the, uh, the Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, which the New York City Board of Education removed from the schools in 1957. Um, now, we can have a really interesting conversation about why that's a very important book 
to teach and for people to read and to understand. It might be one of the most anti-racist books, novels ever written in this country, um, but it has to be taught with a, a degree of, of context and understanding. And so I'm always careful about saying anybody should take any book out of a school without really knowing the issues. But to your point, again, be involved. If somebody's coming into your school and taking books out of your children's hands, you better make sure that you want those books removed and your voice is can be just as powerful as those very, very loud voices saying these books are terrible and they should be removed. And maybe I'm missing something, but largely, you know, largely missing from this conversation, in my opinion, has been the voice of um, superintendents of schools across the country and the uh, corporate citizens, the uh, executives of these publishing companies, these houses that are producing these books and putting them in our academic institutions, uh, you know, elementary, middle and junior high school. I haven't heard from those two audiences. I'll hear from professors at, you know, uh, colleges and universities. I'll hear from social activists and other scholars, but I haven't heard from the superintendents and the corporate titans. Okay, that's a good, it's a good point and a fair question. I think the superintendents are people who are really uh, beholden to their uh, constituents and they're, they're afraid for their jobs. So they're not gonna be the most uh, upstanding of citizens on this count. The publishing industry is pretty powerfully in favor of making sure these are happening. There is an American Library Association that's very active. There's an American Publishers Association. There's a National Coalition Against Censorship. All yeah, but, these but, yeah, but to Torrance, there should be equal and opposite and louder and like you are asking individuals to be loud. Where are the institutions and where are the ad campaigns and where are the social media campaigns? I'm looking at uh, actor D.B. Woodside, who was like, I'm buying up books and giving them out. All the books that are banned, including New, New Kid, uh, my friend Jerry Kraft's book is banned. Uh, he's buying a bunch of them and giving them out. But where is the opposition? It seems like these folk are louder, more organized, and they are more effective then, you know, are we just on our asses with it? Because it's so ridiculous that we're just like, it's going to go away? Because it's not, by the way. It's just definitely the not going, it's not going to go away. And it's, a, and it's a grave danger, as I've said. I, I, I don't exaggerate when I'm saying that you burn books and then you burn people. That's, that's history proves that out. So I don't think that anyone should uh, underestimate how serious this is. Combined with the assault on, uh, what teaching, what history we're teaching, because these things go together. They're completely hand in hand. Uh, this is an assault on education. It's assault on thought. And ultimately, it's an, a one more piece of the assault on democracy that we're seeing around this country. So uh, corporate leaders are not always the, you're absolutely right, corporate leaders are not uh, absolutely at the front of the barricades on a lot of these issues. I will tell you librarians are. Um, the librarians in Texas are heroic right now in their efforts to push back at this. And you're hearing, and I'm hearing much more grassroots uh, resistance from other parents who are saying, wait a minute, this isn't what we want for our children. We have a say in this, we're stakeholders too. So I, I think that this is one of those cases uh, Torin, where you know politicians and corporate leaders aren't usually the ones who are out in front of the parade. They're usually bringing it up. They might pay for the, the floats and the balloons, but they're not gonna lead the parade.